So when we talked about convergence of the Z-transform, we talked about how the Z-transform is a more general transform, and it can handle signals that the DTFT cannot. We're going to do a little bit of development here. We're going to talk about the Z-plane, the complex plane, what it looks like. And we're actually going to see that the Z-transform contains the discrete time Fourier transform. So let's work on that. So first let's just talk about the Z-plane. Another way of saying it, we're just talking about the complex plane. Remember, Z, all it is, is a complex number. And when we deal with complex numbers, if we have to plot them, we plot them against the real part of the complex number and the imaginary part of the complex number. So some arbitrary complex number Z you can think of as a point in a two-dimensional plane. And the way we've been representing Z in this discussion so far is we've thought about it in polar format. So it is some distance away from the origin. That's the distance we call R. And it's also at some angle with respect to the real axis, which is what we call omega. So we've been writing z equals r e to the j omega as the way to represent this complex number. So one thing that's interesting is if we let r equal 1, and remember r, this is that free kind of variable we have in the z-transform that we can set to guarantee that the z-transform converges, and the values for r where the z-transform converges is what we were calling the region of convergence. So let's just pick a particular value for r here and see what happens. Well, when r is equal to 1, then our complex quantity z, which in general is r e to the j omega, just is e to the j omega. The magnitude of z in this case, we take the magnitude of e to the j omega, that's just equal to 1, because e to the j anything, that magnitude is always 1. So this is just a point on the unit circle. So if I was going to replot what this set of points is, for r fixed at 1, but omega a free quantity that really is just mapping out all the points that are a magnitude of 1 away from the origin, which by definition is the unit circle. So what I've sketched here is the set of points e to the j omega, where omega can be any value between 0 and 2 pi, and this is just the unit circle. So this is interesting that if I set r equal to 1, I actually get the points on the unit circle. What we can actually do is if we have the z-transform of a signal, so let's say I've computed x of z, if I have the unit circle in my region of convergence, if I let r equal 1, then I can actually get the DTFT out of the z-transform. So I can actually get the discrete time Fourier transform out of the z-transform by just evaluating my z-transform on the unit circle. So let's see how that works. Here's just our definition of the z-transform we've written down a few times. Remember what z is. z is just r e to the j omega. So if I swap out z with r e to the j omega, this is what my definition of the z-transform looks like. But if I evaluate the z-transform on the unit circle, that's all the points where r is equal to 1, then I have 1 to the minus k, which is just 1 for all time, so that turns into this quantity. But look what this is. This now is just the definition of the DTFT. So I can get out the DTFT, which is x of omega, just by evaluating my z-transform at the set of points where the magnitude of z is equal to 1. And I can do this any time my region of convergence contains the unit circle. So this is something we'll make use of in some of the examples that we work.